I want you to go back and imagine what it would be like to encounter and speak with Mary Magdalene. To hear Peter and to listen to Doubting Thomas and see what they had to say. I couldn't go. I couldn't go when it was light. I had too many tears. I was afraid I would never stop crying. I brought the spices. He deserved a proper burial. I had so many questions. Why? What now? Was this all a lie? There were no answers, so I just kept walking. Lock the door. I told them to lock the door. I had believed the lie. And now they were coming to kill me too. Paranoid? Yeah, maybe. But I watched them beat him. And I knew that they were coming for me next. I had denied him. God forgive me, I had denied him. And I was afraid if I let them find me, I was just going to deny him again. I had imagined every scenario in my head. Perhaps the guards would help us roll away the stone. Maybe they would realize that we just wanted to anoint the body of our Lord. I, that was wishful thinking, I know. The men who murdered him be kind. Maybe God would give me the strength to roll it away myself. Maybe I would be arrested right there. Who else would want to anoint the body of our Lord other than a devout follower. Maybe I wouldn't be arrested. Maybe they would just kill me. Who would miss a prostitute? According to the Jewish law, wasn't I already supposed to be dead? I had imagined every crazy scenario in my head, but when I got to the graveside, I realized I was wrong. I hadn't imagined this. I left everything to follow him. Everything. And he just stood there? Jesus just stood there? I saw him raise Lazarus. With my own eyes, I saw him do it. And he just let himself be crucified? Why? It just didn't make any sense. It was as if this nightmare wouldn't end. Who's taken him? Who's taken him? They've taken the body of my Lord, and I don't know where they've put him. Please tell me. Please tell me who's taken him. Alive? He was here, and everybody saw him? Everybody but me. I missed it. I wasn't important enough. I guess I'm just not their favorite disciple. Whatever. I don't believe them. I won't believe them. I was with John when the women came back from the tomb. Alive? What? I, I ran to the grave, but there was no one there. I didn't know what to think. I wanted to believe. I can't. I can't believe again. I just don't have the strength to believe anymore. I told them, unless I can see the nail marks in his hands and put my finger where the nails were and put my hand in his side, I will not believe. It was with one last desperate breath. I said, sir, if you've carried him away, would you please tell me and I will go get him. And it was then that the gardener turned to me and said, Matthew, Peter, Mary, he said my name and I knew it was him. And in that instant, everything changed. I touched his hands and his side and I believed. I, I believed. believed. He really is a 
alive. He's alive. He's alive. He's alive. I know. I know how to doubt. And my father, he understands this. But I tell you this so that you don't have to. I tell you the truth so that you can believe that Jesus is the Son of God. He's the Messiah. And in believing in Him, you can have life in His name. He's alive! Just think about what it would have been like to have heard those words from Mary and Peter and Thomas. There was no doubt in their hearts. They had seen Him alive. They had been with Him. They had spoken to Him. And they were going everywhere. There was an uproar in the community because these people that had followed Jesus now, they had encountered Him and seen Him alive. And they were going everywhere. And they were telling everybody, He's alive! He's alive! I saw Him! He is alive! I want you to understand the power of an eyewitness. The Bible tells us there were between five and 600 people that were eyewitnesses to the resurrection of Jesus Christ. It's something that is firmly established in history it's something that if you have any doubts, if you are honest and you will research it, you will see the body of evidence that is there that says Jesus Christ rose from the dead. He's alive! Amen? He's alive! I want you to turn with me today to the book of 1 Corinthians, and I want us to look at chapter 15, verse 20. Through 26. This is a powerful passage of Scripture. And it's my heart's prayer that every one of us, when we leave this service today, that we would have a fresh understanding of what the resurrection of Jesus Christ means for each and every one of us today. Because it's more than just church tradition. It is firmly established in history but it's more than that he's alive today and his resurrection power is alive for us today amen I've titled this message uh, an interesting title that may cause you to step back at first I've entitled it the day you rise again if you noted the song that Misha sang, part of the song was talking about Jesus' resurrection. The grave couldn't hold him down. But the other part of that song was speaking about the fact that because Jesus rose from the dead, we will rise again as well. Amen? Death can't hold this body down. Amen? Let's look at this great passage of Scripture. Chapter 15. Of 1 Corinthians, verse 20. But now Christ is risen from the dead and has become the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For since by man came death, by man also came the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ all shall be made alive. But each one in his own order. Christ, the first fruits, afterward those who are Christ at his coming. Then comes the end, when he delivers the kingdom to God the Father, when he puts an end to all rule and all authority and power. For he must reign till he has put all enemies under his feet. The last enemy that will be destroyed is death. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word today. We pray that it would just come alive in our hearts and in our lives. 
Lord, that today we would have a fresh realization of what the resurrection of Jesus means for our lives today. Lord, I just pray your blessing upon this message, upon every person here. Lord, that when we leave this place, Lord, that every one of us would just rejoice in what the resurrection of Jesus means for our lives. Not just in the future, but right now. In Jesus' name, amen. There's a funny little story that I'd like to share with you about Easter. There was a pastor who was excited about Easter, as all pastors are excited about Easter. And he came to church early, he got ready, and he was there, and he went downstairs. He, he said, I want to see the children before the service starts. He, he goes downstairs, and he looks at the children, and he finds some five-year-olds and he says, he walks up to him and says, can anybody tell me what the resurrection of Jesus means for us today? What is Easter really about? What are we celebrating? And one little girl lifts her hand and she goes, it's when Jesus was born and we carved pumpkins to celebrate. The children's church leader cringed <laughs> and said, oh, what is the pastor going to think? I'm teaching these kids. So the pastor just went on and he saw a little boy and he said, what do you think Easter means? And this little boy was very confident and he said, it's when God gave us George Washington and we shoot off firecrackers. Now, not only was the children's leader cringing, but the pastor was really starting to wonder what the kids were being taught. So there was one more little boy he looks at, and this little boy raises his hand. He goes, yes, what is Easter about? And he goes, Jesus rose from the grave. And the pastor goes, oh. And the, the, Sunday, the children's church leader goes, oh. And then the little boy continues. And if he sees a shadow, he goes back in. <laughs> Thankfully, this was not our children's worker. Don't tell Melinda I told that story. I want you to note in verse 20, but now Christ is risen. He didn't go back in. He didn't die later. The verse says, now Christ is risen. Now. He's alive right now. He's on the throne. He's in control. There should be no doubt in our hearts and in our lives. There's that assurance. Our Jesus lives. Amen. He lives. He lives, church. He lives. And that's my heart today, that we would have a fresh understanding of what His resurrection means for us. Because the resurrection of Jesus in this passage is tied together with our resurrection. And because we know that the facts point to the, the evidence of, of, of Jesus rising again, and that He's alive right now, then there is an assurance that comes to our hearts that says, Jesus rose again, he's the first fruits, and one day I will rise again because he lives, I will live also. In John chapter 14 and verse 19, Jesus said those words, because I live, you will live also. He's saying, I have resurrection power for your life right now. The power of my resurrection hasn't diminished. The power of my resurrection is here. Wherever you need resurrection power, Jesus has resurrection power for you. And there's no doubt that gathered today, there are many of us that are struggling in an area of life where death is trying to come against us. We live in a world where death comes in various ways and tries to 
uh, infiltrate our lives, tries to come against our lives, tries to destroy our lives. But the promise of Jesus is there's resurrection power for your life right now, right here today. Bring me those dead things. And at the end of the service today, I'm going to invite everyone as we will have a prayer team. And the prayer team will be across the front of the auditorium and they'll circle around the back of the auditorium as well. And when we come to those, those moments at the end of this service, I'm going to ask you, if there's anything dead in your life, will you bring that to Jesus today and allow Him to bring life where there's been death? Because He is our resurrected Lord. In Acts chapter 1, verse 3, Acts is the second book that was written by Luke. Luke was a physician. And Luke is a well-respected historian. There are books from antiquity that we have that are studied in a field of study to see if they're trustworthy. If we can believe these ancient documents are, are truth as to what happened in those days. And Luke is one of the most well-respected authors from antiquity. In his second book, in Acts chapter 1, verse 3, he says this about Jesus. He also presented himself alive after his suffering by many infallible proofs, being seen by them during 40 days and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. Over a period of 40 days, Jesus appeared. And he was real. He had a real body. He ate with them. He moved with them. He wasn't a ghost. He wasn't a hallucination, a figment of their imagination. He was real. We see that he was seen by between five and six hundred people. He was seen by Mary Magdalene. He was seen by Simon Peter. He was seen by Thomas. He was also seen by ten fugitives that were hiding, that were afraid for their lives. He was also seen on the road to Damascus by Saul of Tarsus, who was a persecutor of, of anyone who believed in Jesus Christ. He didn't believe that Jesus was the Messiah, so he desired to kill anyone that had any faith in Christ or had anything to do with Christ. But on the road to Damascus, he had a genuine encounter with the living Lord of glory, and it transformed his life. No longer was he persecuting them, but he fell down before him. He worshipped him, and he became one of his followers. And he wrote two-thirds of the New Testament, and he spurred people on. He established churches. He encouraged them. Why? Because he had had a resurrection encounter with Jesus. He said, he's alive. I saw him, and he transformed my life. Encounter after encounter we read about. At his ascension, there were over a hundred people gathered at his ascension. Another time he was teaching on a hill in Galilee. Teaching about the kingdom of God, the rule of God for our lives. And scripture says there were over 500 people that were present at that time. There's a body of evidence physical evidence. God doesn't call us to blind faith. This story doesn't begin once upon a time in a land far, far away. Amen? It's not a myth. It's not a legend. It's not a fanciful idea created in the mind of some man. We see that the body of evidence said that those that were followers of him, his closest disciples, many of them died horrible deaths and, and, and suffered horrible things and were martyred and they went to their death and endured the torture and the, the horrible pain and the suffering and the death. Why? Because the encounter was real. What a powerful statement that is. 
I guarantee you if I was making up a story and someone was going to crucify me upside down on a cross made like an X, I think I would recant my story. Amen? None of them recanted their story. They endured it. Why? Because he lives and they knew that his resurrection determined they would rise again as well. Amen? That they had everlasting life. That it wasn't just a fanciful story. It wasn't a conspiracy. Some people say, oh, it was a conspiracy. They were just trying to start a new religion. Oh, yeah, sure. Some people say, oh, he swooned on the cross. But there's evidence there. And we don't have time to get into all the evidence. And I'm not going to do that today. But you can study that by educated men that lay it all out, those that are doctors that said there's no way that he did not die, that he wasn't dead, that he just swooned. They, they point to the evidence, and the evidence is overwhelming. Church, it's a fact. You can deny it, or you can embrace it. But if you deny it, it doesn't change the fact. He lives. He lives. And you want to know how I know that he lives? Because he lives within my heart. Because I'm one of those witnesses to the transforming power of Jesus Christ in my heart and in my life. I'm not the same anymore. That's how I know he lives. His resurrection power is still alive. It is still for us today. Because I bowed my knee one day and I said, I need God in my life. I'm a sinner. I've failed and God met me there, and Jesus came into my life, and I've never been the same again. And I'll tell you right now, I don't like milk without Jesus. I don't like him at all. The only way I can tolerate him is because of Jesus. And if we're honest today, all of us will say an amen to that. Amen. But this text... In Scripture, it connects the resurrection with Jesus to our resurrection. In the last short period of time, as a pastor, I've had to proceed over four different funerals. We lost our wonderful brother William. We lost Ramona. I traveled to Texas because Melinda, my wife's mother, passed away. And I presided over that funeral. And then just this past week, a gentleman, Dave Berry, passed away. And he, he had moved south, but he had lived here for many years. And we had his funeral right here. As a pastor, I can tell you that it's one of the most difficult things that a pastor's called to do. Is to come into those times when, when people are hurting and they're struggling and they're suffering from loss. And we realize how inadequate we truly are. To, to, to come and to, to help in any way. But when that individual is like William and Ramona and my mother-in-law and Dave, they've placed their, their faith and their trust in Jesus Christ, then there is a holy uh, boldness that comes upon us as pastors. And we can come to the family in the midst of their loss, in the midst of their, their grief and their sorrow, and we can tell them, because He lives, your loved one will live also. Amen? That because Jesus was the first fruits of the resurrection, church, we will live also because we placed our faith and our trust in Jesus Christ. In this text, it firmly relates our resurrection to Jesus' resurrection. But the Bible tells us We live only once that we die and then comes the judgment. Because Jesus is alive and He conquered death and He was resurrected, every one of us is going to be resurrected one day with a brand new body. Everyone will be resurrected. Whether you believe in Jesus or whether you do not, you will be resurrected. 
That's what God's Word teaches us. And for those that do not know the Lord, that have rejected Him and turned from Him, we will have to give an account before the Lord for our rejecting the gift of Christ. Not trusting Him, not believing Him, not receiving the free gift of salvation from Him. And God's Word says that we'll be separated from Him for eternity. But if we know Jesus, if we've placed our faith and trust in Him, then we have a, an assurance with the resurrection, church, when we stand before Him and have to give an account, we're not giving an account for our failures, for our sin, because all our failures and all our sin was placed upon Jesus upon the cross. Amen? And we sang about it this morning. By the power of the blood of Jesus, we are washed clean. Amen? Is there anybody clean here today? Not because of your righteousness, but because of the righteousness of Jesus. And then we will be resurrected. We will stand before the Lord and we will give an account for the life that we live for Him, following Him. And it says that we will receive rewards. I don't know about you, but I want to be in the second group. Amen? When I begin to share at a funeral, it is, there is hope. There's not grief. There's not loss to the extent of those that, that come in and they, they don't have family members that, that have trusted Jesus. And I've, I've presided over funerals like that where, where I had no doubt in my mind that the person didn't put their faith and trust in Jesus. And there was no hope in the family. But church... There is a difference about the funeral of a Christian because we have a genuine hope in Jesus Christ. We have the, the assurance that we're going to live because Jesus is alive. Amen. And we're going to receive a brand new body. Amen. Some of us could say, I'm ready for that right now. Amen. Our bodies are in a state of decay. We don't like to hear that. That's why we use deodorant. <laughs> Our bodies in the... Frank's over here going, did I put on my deodorant? It's true and we know it. Our bodies are decaying. But one day because Jesus has a glorified body, He rose again, we put our faith and trust in Him, we will have glorified bodies. Amen. <laughs> there ain't no grave going to hold us down. Amen. Because he rose again, we're going to rise again. I'm thankful for that today. How about you? In Hebrews chapter 9, verse 27, it tells us, And is it, it is appointed for man to die once, but after this, the judgment. There are those that in our culture today that believe in reincarnation. That goes against Scripture. Some people won't even eat cows because they think people come back as cows. I'm from Texas, I eat a lot of good steak, and I'm not coming back as a cow. And I'm not trying to mock those people, they're sincere in their religion, but the problem is that religion doesn't cut it, amen? Religion didn't defeat death. Religion didn't rise from, from, the, from the dead, and religion isn't ruling over the universe, amen? It's our Jesus. It's our Jesus. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, it talks about our, our resurrected bodies. In verse 52, it says, In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. I'm looking forward to a glorified body. How about you? In our text, it also mentions two things I want us to see. In verse 22, it says, for as in Adam all die. And in verse 25 it says, 
he, speaking of Christ, must reign till he has put all enemies under his feet. Church, we struggle with enemies every day. We struggle with death. Death has been passed down. If you don't believe it, remember when you had a two-year-old running around. There's a two-year-old almost in my house running around. And I love him to death. I love all my grandkids. But you can see that sin nature that all of us have that's been passed down from generation to generation. Guess where he got it from? Part of, He got it from Big Paul. He's starting to learn words. One of the first words he learned, no. Last night, I, I was showing him some puppies on my phone. He, he gives me this glance. He's not even two yet. And he gets his hand and he pushes it away. No. It's ingrained in us. It's part of our nature. We are wired to sin. From Adam. Adam. In Adam all die. All of us are experiencing that physical death because of sin. And you want to blame Adam? Well, guess what? You're just as much to blame. Because we've all sinned. If we're honest with ourselves, we understand there are absolutes. Even though we live in a culture that wants to say there are no absolutes. If you're honest, God has placed that understanding in our hearts. You talk to somebody that says, oh, anything's okay. I'm tolerant of everything. You, you know, everybody just do your own thing. And you ask them about absolutes. Are there any absolutes? No, there's not any absolutes. Well, if there are no absolutes, what happens if, if I come and I assault you or take your life? No, you can't do that. Why? If there are no absolutes, there's no absolutes. Deep down inside, we understand that there are certain things that God has just placed within us that we comprehend, yes, this is right and yes, this is wrong. It's not about being taught that. It's just something naturally that we understand. There are absolutes. There is a God who created the heavens and the earth and created us. And he, he placed that within us. But the world wants to deny that. We face enemies. And I'm not talking about the person at work that's trying to get your job. Or the boss that you have that gives you a hard time. And I'm not talking about our military enemies. Yes, our nation has military enemies. But I'm talking about the enemies that come against your life every day. And many times, it not, it's not just circumstances, but it's demonic in its origin. And you say, oh, pastor, you really believe that stuff? Jesus did. In fact, he said of Satan, he said, he comes not before to steal, to kill, and destroy, but I have come that you might have life and have it more abundant. Amen? There is an enemy that tries to come all the time and destroy our marriages, destroy our finances, destroy our morale, to, to stop us, to bring death into our fulfillment of why God created us and the purpose that God has for us. But Jesus, in this passage, it says, I love this passage, He must reign till He has put all enemies under His feet. Is He reigning in your life? Are you bringing Him the dead things and allowing Jesus to bring resurrection power into what the enemy is trying to steal from you and kill in your life and destroy in your life? And where death has come, His resurrection power is greater. He's greater than any enemy trying to take you out. Amen? He's alive. How many have ever noticed death trying to come against your cash flow? Death tries to come, you lose your job, and all of a sudden your cash flow is gone. You're struggling. You don't know how you're going to make it. You bring that dead thing to Jesus and have Him resurrect it. 
I've shared many times when I've been in financial situations struggling, and I shared the one where I was at Christmas and didn't have money for my kids to buy them anything. And we bar- I could barely put food on the table. But I prayed and said, God, I love my kids. I want to bless my kids. The next day, a man walks up to me and hands me $300. I didn't say a thing to him. He didn't know anything. He said, God told me to give you this. I'm giving you $300 so you can buy kid- presents for your kids for Christmas. That's the resurrection power of Christ working in our cash flow. Amen? I have a cousin who is a, an evangelist with the Assemblies of God in uh, South America. His name is Steve Skipper. And he, he's, he's a big guy. He's a fiery preacher. You think I'm fiery or get loud? You haven't seen nothing yet. He, I mean, he, he, he's been preaching down south to all the southern... Uh, countries and Argentina, different places, and boy, God's been moving, and he does great, like, he's, he's a, like Billy Graham, he has huge um, uh, uh, the, uh, anthem theaters, you know, just filled with people, and when he gives the invitation, they'll, they'll jump down from the balconies and the walls and just drop down into the field, and they'll come running to, to receive Jesus. But there was a time when he was a little bitty boy, that Steve stuck something into the light socket and electrocuted himself. And he was just a toddler. His mother was ironing, and and I don't remember exactly what took place, but he electrocuted himself, and and his mother just saw it. She was right there, and, and she just screamed, and she ran over, and she picked up little Steve and his body was just lifeless and limp. There, he wasn't breathing. There wasn't a heartbeat. He it electrocuted himself. And she, she ran downstairs. She was in the apartment of, above the garage of my grandfather's home. She ran down the stairs. She ran oh, into the house and she was screaming. And she ran over to my grandfather and said, he's dead. He electrocuted himself. And she handed him to my grandfather. My grandfather, he didn't know anything else to do but to pray. And he just began to pray. He prayed for God's resurrection power to bring life to that little uh, precious child that had just been electrocuted. And as he prayed, all of a sudden, life came back into that little baby. And you say, oh, pastor, that's one of those preacher stories. One of these days, I'm going to bring Steve up here, and I'm going to have him tell you that story himself. Because God has used him throughout South America in various countries to win hundreds and hundreds and thousands of people to Jesus. Why? Because the resurrection power of Christ is for now. It's for whatever death tries to come against your family. And last night I got a call about 10 o'clock saying that Michelle, my youngest daughter, was in the hospital along with the little grandson that I shared with you named Zeke. He's named Ezekiel. He has a respiratory virus and an ear infection and he wasn't getting enough oxygen and she took him to the hospital and I went down there In church, guess what I prayed? For the resurrection power of Christ to enter his body and overcome the death. Amen? It's for today. It's not something that we just say is church tradition that doesn't really matter. It's not just for the future that one day we're going to come out of the grave with a resurrected, glorified body. It means right now, whatever death is coming against your life, Jesus has resurrection power that's greater than any death that's coming against you. In Christ, in Christ, I want you to notice this. In verse 22, even so, in Christ, all shall be made alive. Why does God the Father in Scripture say, in Christ, it's only in Him? Does it mean that Jesus isn't tolerant? Does it mean that He doesn't love people of other uh, religions or spiritual things? No, Jesus loves them. But church, the facts are the facts. 
Religion doesn't make you right with God. It's man's attempt to make us right with God. Jesus did what we cannot do. If we go and try to live the best life we can possibly live, we're still short of the glory of God. We still haven't accomplished what what righteousness truly is and what we need to be saved and to be right with God. Jesus alone accomplished that. No one else came out of the tomb. And I know it's not politically correct, but Muhammad is still in his tomb. Any political leader, Stalin, is still in his tomb. You can go down the list. They're all still in the tomb. But Jesus is alive with resurrection power right now, right here today. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. The way, the truth, the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. It's not Jesus being intolerant. It's not that at all. He's saying, no one else could do what I had to do to purchase your salvation. No one else lived a perfect life, a sinless life. God came down from heaven. God incarnate. He lived a sinless life. And then He went to the cross and all of our sin, all of our sin, all of your sin, past sin, present sin, future sin, it was all placed on Jesus on the cross. He paid for our sin. But that wasn't enough. He overcame death. If Jesus himself hadn't have been pure and hadn't been holy, death would have had legal right to keep a hold on him. Because Jesus was sinless, the sinless son of God, death couldn't hold him. The grave couldn't hold him. Amen? And his resurrection power and life is still for us today. In verse 26, it talks about the last enemy that will be destroyed is death. And it's going to be destroyed for the rest of universal history. We will never have to deal with death again. How many are looking forward to that day? We're going to enter eternity based on what Jesus has done for us. In John chapter 17, verse 3, and this is eternal life. That they may know you, the, one, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. Church, eternal life is more than timelessness. Eternal life is knowing God. Being in His presence. Experiencing Him. And church, you don't have to wait heaven to do that amen how do I know he's alive today because I have resurrection life in me I know that I'm gonna live forever I know one day I'm gonna have a resurrected body a glorified body and I can't wait but it's more than that right now I have a relationship with my Creator my Savior my Lord and everyone in this building who has committed their heart and life to Jesus Christ knows the same thing I have resurrection life living in me I'm gonna live forever when we think about heaven in our culture today it's interesting to me that when we have a culture that denies Christ In a culture that says that heaven is just a a comforting figment of everybody's imagination. It's not real. But yet, have listen, have you ever noticed how many songs in the secular realm talk about heaven? Have you ever noticed how many people write poems or write books or different things even though they don't believe in Christ they're writing in their books about heaven have you ever noticed how many movies that that aren't necessarily Christian movies but they're just secular movies but yet they have something to do with heaven there's a heaven 
Why do you think that is, church? Why do you think that we have this underlying message that God's placed in our hearts that there is a heaven? It's because the Scripture says, listen to this, the Scripture says God has placed eternity in our hearts. We know that this isn't all there is. And so even though they don't know Jesus, they're talking about heaven, they're wishing about heaven, they're, they're, they're thinking, wow, I hope this isn't all there is. But church, as Christians, we understand because Christ is in us, that resurrection life is in us, we have an assurance, heaven is a real place, amen? Heaven is a real place. In John chapter 14, listen to what Jesus said. He said, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself that where I am there you may be also. I've read that countless times at funeral service and memorial service. Why? Because it's Jesus assuring us that heaven is real. Amen? He's gone to prepare a place for us. Because we've placed our faith and our trust in Him. We've received Him as our Lord and as our Savior. He is preparing a place for us. Begin to imagine right now what your tastes are. What, what, what is your mansion going to look like? For some of you, it's a southern bell mansion with big white columns. Think about it. What, 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 what do you think Jesus is preparing for you? Well, actually, the word there that's translated many times as mansion is, is, is rooms or places. And so it's going to be better than a mansion. We're going to be in, we're going to have basically a mansion inside the Father's house. In His house with God, our Creator. Think about how beautiful it's going to be. How wonderful it's going to be. Because of Jesus' resurrection, we have that assurance. Amen? As followers, of, as followers of Christ, we have that assurance in our hearts. I want to give you one last verse, and I'm going to ask the worship team to come. In Romans chapter 8, verse 16, it says, The Spirit Himself bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God, and joint heirs with Christ. Because He lives, we shall live also. Amen? I want you to stand with me. I want to ask our prayer team to begin to gather around the outside of the auditorium today. In just a moment, we're going to baptize several young people, and we're excited about that. But before we do, I want everyone to just bow your head for a moment. Just close your eyes, and I want you to let the Lord talk to you. What are the dead things in your life right now? Is there any area, maybe it's your marriage, maybe it's your finances, maybe it's at work, maybe it's a struggle in your emotions, maybe it's physical, whatever the, whatever the death is coming against in your life right now. I want you to welcome the resurrection life of Jesus into that area. And as the worship team begins to play, I want you to step out and I want you to find someone around the auditorium to pray with today. We're not going to take a long time, but we want to make sure that we have time 
bring those dead things to the Lord and ask Him to bring His resurrection life and power. Our elders are on this side of the auditorium in the back. If you have a physical need, the Bible says call upon the elders and that they will anoint you with oil. And the prayer of faith shall raise the sick. Whatever your need is today, as they begin to play, I want you to begin to worship. If there's, if there's not an area in your life that death is attacking right now, then just begin to worship Him and welcome His presence to, to just reaffirm that we're going to rise again. To reaffirm that He's on the throne, that He's in control, that right now Christ is risen. And just worship Him.
How you guys doing? I'm Joe. Most of you know me. Some of you know me. So 19 years ago, I'm going to take you back a while. So 19 years ago, I was 15. I was at a party, and uh, me and a kid got into it. Ended up getting in a fight. I got my teeth knocked out. My friends dropped me off at the hospital. Teeth were pushed back in my throat. And uh, woke up the next day with braces on, jaw wired shut. So I was looking, I was looking for this kid for, well, it was 15 years. I, I didn't see him for 15 years. And then uh, I came to church with my wife, uh, girlfriend at the time, four years ago. Randy McPherson was speaking, and uh, he was talking about forgiveness. Well, I looked to the to the right of me, the same aisle, same same row. Look to the right of me, and I see him after 15 years of looking for this kid and who knows you know what would have happened and first time I ever walked up and talked with someone about anything it was about forgiveness I walked back to the row my wife already knew what was going on I walked over to him and I told him I forgave him from that moment on I, I felt the power I felt the power of God I've seen, I've seen him three times since, well, this is the fourth time now. That was the first time I've seen him in 15 years. I've seen him three more times in the past four years. The last time I saw him was a couple days ago at Walmart, and we smiled at each other like we were friends. And he's here today. And talk about the power of forgiveness and the true resurrection. Jesse, would you come up here? I, I just figured, you know, some of these younger teens would like to hear a story, you know, and, uh, you know, put the past behind everyone. And, uh, you know, don't hold a grudge. If you got friends, family members, someone you don't know that you held a grudge with, uh, you know, <laughs> half your life, um, you know, put it aside and move forward. And, you know, there is good in everything, and, and uh, you know, God is that, that way. So, uh, thank you. And now, we're going to baptize some believers in Jesus. Amen? You may be seated. Just a second. All right, I'm going to invite Sarah to come on down. Yeah. I met Sarah uh, a couple weeks ago, and it's so cool to hear her testimony, and she's wanting to rededicate her life back to God and to, to follow after him. So this is the next step in obedience to Christ. So are you ready? All right, stand in front of me. 
Um, let's turn the other way. There we go. Bingo. Okay. Um, go ahead and get, get ready. There you go. All right. Upon your confession of faith in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, buried in the likeness of our Savior's death and raised in the likeness of our Savior's resurrection to walk in the newness of life. I just want to hold there for a second. Don't drop on me. I'm going to invite the next person out. Come on down, Eliana. Eliana. <laughs> Elena. It's the way that she spells her name. I'm still learning it. But she is another one of new students to our youth group. I'm so happy to see her get baptized. It is going to be amazing. Um, so go ahead and get your arms ready. <laughs> Upon your confession of faith. It's not too cold, is it? <laughs> Upon your confession of faith in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, buried in the likeness of our Savior's death and raised in the likeness of our Savior's resurrection to walk in the newness of life. All right, come on, Josh. This young man is amazing. He's in sixth grade, and he's been in youth group for about nine months now. And um, God spoke to him the other night at youth group as we were entering into the presence of God. It was really awesome. And this is the first time God spoke to Josh. And uh, what did he say to you? He said, Josh, you are ready. You must be baptized. And... So God told him to get baptized. So, yeehaw, let's go for it. I'm going to... Go ahead and get your, your, there you go. All right. Upon your confession of faith in Jesus Christ, as your Lord and Savior, I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, buried in the likeness of our Savior's death, raised in the likeness of our Savior's resurrection to walk in the newness of life. Nicholas, you, you ready? Let's do this. The reason why I like Nicholas so much is because we share the same name. <laughs> yeah. Yeehaw. <laughs> All right. Come on down, my friend. All right, why are you getting baptized, man? Come on, that's awesome, bro. All right, come over here. I want to ask you to, to put your hands um, over your nose like we were doing before, if you can stand still just for a little bit. All right. <laughs> Upon your confession of faith in Jesus Christ, as your Lord and Savior, I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, buried in the likeness of our Savior's death and raised in the likeness of our Savior's resurrection to walk in the newness of life. Come on down, LJ. I'll get, I got your towel. <laughs> All right, why do you want to get baptized today, man? I would like to stay with God for the rest of my life, and I don't want to have trouble with my faith. Ooh, I like it. All right, go ahead and put your, your uh, hand on your nose, and we're going to go for it. Upon your confession of faith in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, buried in the resurrection of our Savior's death and raised in, the, in our Savior's resurrection uh, to walk in the newness of life. We 
got one more youth, uh, Miss Faith. All right. I'm going to ask you, why are you getting baptized today? Finally quit fighting with God. I decided to trust him. I'm, he has a plan for my life, and here's the first step. Amen. Awesome. Amen. All right. Let's go for it. I'm going to ask you to put your hand over your nose. All right. Upon your confession of faith in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, raised in the likeness of our Savior's death, or buried in the likeness of our Savior's death, raised in the likeness of our Savior's resurrection to walk in the newness of life. Praise the Lord. Would you stand with me? Oh, there's one. He come. Oh. That's the end of the U, so you can sit down again. Go Rob. So, come on, Constance. This is Constance. And, uh, because of her confession of faith, she wants to be baptized. And uh, I baptize people a little bit differently than other people because uh, I feel like we should experience that moment in the grave. We should unload some baggage of our life. We should put down the old man and we should come out empowered by the resurrection power that Jesus purchased for us. And uh, I believe this is such a powerful moment I, uh, I just rejoiced with Constance because everything is going to change in her life today. Um, God is going to empower her through his Holy Spirit to live the life that he called us to live. And uh, so right now, Constance, because of your confession of faith, I'm going to baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. This is going to be in the likeness of his burial and the likeness of his resurrection to walk in the power that he gave us to live this life and walk it out in Jesus' name. Are you ready? Okay, Norman, come on down here, brother. This is my brother Norman. God is doing some amazing, amazing things in his life. And he said, I want to be first. I want to be first. I want to go. So, because of your confession of faith in Jesus Christ, dying on the cross for your sins, being raised from the dead, I'm going to baptize you now in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit in the likeness of his death and burial and in the likeness of his resurrection to empower you to live out and walk this life in Jesus' name. Kurt. You put those right over here. <laughs> Amen. It's really going to feel good in a minute. <laughs> we have a great group of guys right now. God is good. Um, so, because of your confession of faith, uh, you were baptized before, right? But uh, it was it was getting wet in church one time, right? It was 
getting wet and nothing happening. Yeah, amen. But now he understands what this really is about. Uh, he understands the empowerment that comes through obedience um, to Christ. So, because of your confession of faith in the fact that Jesus died on the cross for your sins, he rose again to empower you to live this life. I'm going to baptize you in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, buried in the likeness of his burial and death, raised in the likeness of his resurrection, to walk in the fullness of what he provided for you. Amen. Casey. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You know what you're going to leave in the grave? Okay. Amen. I'm rejoicing with you. <laughs> because of your confession of faith in the fact that Jesus died on the cross for all of your sins, rose again to empower you to live the life that he called you to live, I'm going to baptize you in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit buried in the likeness of his death and burial and raised in the likeness of his resurrection to empower you to live it out and walk the rest of your life with him. Frank the worshiper. Hallelujah. <laughs> There's a new guy right there, I tell you. That's the face of a new guy. <laughs> a new man in Christ. Hallelujah. Because of your confession of faith in Jesus dying on the cross for your sins, being raised again to empower you to live the life. I'm going to baptize you in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Buried in the likeness of his death and burial, raised in the likeness of his resurrection, to empower you to live it out. Thank you, Jesus, for what you're going to do. You got things you know what you're going to leave in the grave? Okay. to the cross for you, died for your sins, rose again to empower you. Amen. Amen. So, because of your confession of faith, I'm going to baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, buried in the likeness of his death and, and burial, raised in the likeness of his resurrection to empower you to live this life in the fullness that he intended.
because of your confession of faith in the cross and the resurrection the power that both of those things brought to your life I'm going to baptize you in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit buried in the likeness of his death and burial raised in the likeness of his resurrection empowering you to live the life that he called you to live you want to say something? Praise the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Josh, my brother. Okay. Jesus saved you? Amen. Amen. <laughs> because of your confession of faith of what Jesus did for you on the cross, what his resurrection meant to you, I'm going to baptize you in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Buried in the likeness of his res er, in his death and burial, and raised in the likeness of his resurrection to empower you to live this life. Amen. You ready? Amen. Travis has a broken foot, but Jesus is not only our Savior, he's our healer, he's our deliverer, and he said, Travis said, I don't, I don't want to miss this just because I got a broken bone, um, this is powerful, I believe Travis has a call on his life that the enemies tried to steal, kill, destroy. Because of your confession of faith, I baptize you in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Buried in the image of his death and burial, raised in the likeness of his resurrection. I empower you to live this out. You know what you're going to leave in the grave? Okay. Amen. Brokenness. Let's leave brokenness in the grave. Hallelujah. Amen. Will you stand with me? Isn't that an awesome way to conclude an Easter service?
That isn't just a Christian tradition to be baptized. It's something the Lord instructs us to do. And if you've committed your heart to the Lord and you've never been baptized, I want to encourage you to be baptized. Because it's a powerful encounter. and God works in our lives. It's not just tradition. Amen. How many would agree with me today that Jesus is alive? Amen. He lives. Amen. Father, I just thank you for this glorious day that we've gathered here to celebrate our Savior and our Lord. And Lord, I just bless everyone that's here today. I bless them. Lord, from the infants in the nursery, our children's church, our teens, our young adults, our seniors, Lord, I bless them in the name of Jesus. And I pray for your resurrection power, your resurrection life, Lord, to come against any death in our lives. Lord, whether it's our marriage or finances or relationships, whatever it is, Lord, I speak resurrection life in the name of Jesus over your people today. And Lord, as we leave this place, let us just rejoice. Lord, that because you came out of that tomb, Lord, the grave can't hold us either. Lord, to be absent from this body is to be present with you and one day have that resurrected body. Lord, I bless your people today and we rejoice in what you've done for us. Let it continue to stir our hearts. In Jesus' glorious name, amen. Turn and greet somebody today and tell them he lives.